Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I'm Catherine Marshall, speaking from Washington from the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to a discussion uh, about uh, Kenya and about the approaches of the Catholic Church, particularly uh, to refugee uh, and internally displaced populations. Um, Kenya is one of the uh, largest refugee hosting countries in Africa with many years uh, of experience, uh, many complexities and many uh, lessons uh, that it offers. Uh, this event, which is recorded, uh, the recording will be available afterwards, uh, is designed as a discussion, and it is part of a project that the Berkeley Center has been engaged in for several years uh, to look at the global humanitarian crisis represented by forced migration, uh, and particularly its religious dimensions, which are too often ignored. Uh, and so that is the focus of the Berkeley Center Project. And there are several colleagues, including um, Father David Hollenbach, who's part of the discussion today, uh, that have been working on different dimensions in different parts of the world for several years. So today, uh, we are very much focusing on Kenya, and we have three colleagues who are in Nairobi, who are speaking to us from Nairobi. Uh, we have um, Jeffrey uh, Shikuku, who is the Je Jesuit Refugee Service Country Director for Kenya. He's also a specialist in education as part of uh, humanitarian crises uh, of different kinds. Um, we also have Father um, Bill O'Neill, uh, who has been spending a lot of time, particularly in the Kakuma camp. He's a specialist in ethics and also uh, in the humanitarian crises generally. And he's been traveling a lot, but he's now back in Kenya, at least as far as I understand it. Um, Sister Hedwig Muse uh, is, a member of the Little Sisters of Mary Immaculate. She's a lawyer, a human rights lawyer. We've recently had the pleasure of hosting her in Washington as part of a fellowship uh, for uh, Catholic sisters uh, that Georgetown University has been working on in cooperation with the Gates Foundation and the Hilton Foundation. So we've had the, the pleasure of getting to know um, Sister Hedwig uh, and her work. And last, but of course not least by any means, is Father David Hollenbach, uh, who is a, a senior fellow um, and a professor uh, at Georgetown, and who has spent a lot of time in Kenya, uh, and who has written several books about the refugee situation. As background, I uh, have worked a lot on Kenya over many decades, I would say, um, first for the World Bank, and we have also uh, in the Berkeley Center and the World Faiths Development Dialogue spent a good bit of time looking at the ways in which religious uh, issues and dimensions uh, are relevant um, for the strategies for development in Kenya. Basically, Kenya is one of the largest refugee hosting countries. It's the number two at this point in all of Africa. And what you can see from this map is that there are uh, almost 580,000 officially registered refugees, but there also are another 100,000 plus who are in different stages of registration, meaning that you have about 800,000 people uh, in Kenya who are in an official refugee status. Plus, you have a very shifting and complex population of people internally displaced, whether by climate issues like flooding or by internal tensions. Uh, so the that is basically your statistics. You can see that there are two large concentrations of refugees, um, first in the Dadaab camps, uh, which is near the Somali border. Those have been there for decades. 
Uh, and also in the far uh, northwest, you have the Kakuma, which has recently, and we'll hear about this, been um, increased with the situations in both South Sudan and Sudan. And in addition, you have a significant number of refugees who are in Nairobi. I was looking this morning at the statistics, and one thing that is quite striking when we're looking to solutions is that in last year, there were 97 people only of this total of about 800,000 who were resettled to third countries uh, and or repatriated to their country of origin. That number, at least from what I saw, is zero. Um, and so you have a, a classic, very protracted refugee situation, a dynamic one with a lot of shifts, but basically that is the overall picture. So with that, if you could stop, well, just why don't you quickly go through the uh, other, uh, no, uh, yes. Let's go through the two pictures. This is just a picture of the Kakuma camp to give you an idea. And then the next slide um, is, is a more dynamic, more human picture of what's happening there. And now um, we'll go to Jeffrey Shikuku, who can give us um, a, basically an introduction, both to how you see the situation. I gave you some stark statistics, but how do you see the situation within the Kenya uh, environment, but above all, what is JRS doing? What is JRS in Kenya? Uh, and what uh, what is it, the scope of its work? So we'll turn over to you, uh, um, Jeffrey. Good, thank you so much, Catherine and uh, colleagues, happy to have you. Um, the, the refugee situation in Kenya, as uh, Catherine put it, it's been here for decades. I think Kenya started hosting refugees pre-independence and immediately even after independence with the civil wars around Uganda and, and the country surrounding us like Ethiopia. And um, Kenya has been responding to this by opening its doors to refugees, uh, both from Somalia, South Sudan, Uganda, DRC, Ethiopia, and most of the countries in the Horn of Africa. Um, in a couple of years, we saw kind of a trend where when the government kept talking about camp closure, that began around 2016, all the way to not even earlier, 2013, 2016, 2017, and lately uh, in 2022. So before then, there was generally a downward trend though not very marginal, especially for Somali refugees. Uh, there was a repatriation package for them to go back home. But I must say that in the entire, from around 2014, only around 80,000 refugees have been repatriated back to, to Somalia for, for such a long uh, period, it's almost uh, 10 years, meaning that the situation back home uh, is not that rosy. And the statistics Catherine gave were for January. And I must indicate that uh, we are generally facing an influx from Somalia related to climate change, mainly drought that has hit um, the Horn of Africa for the last three years. But I think climax this year and uh, in the Dab alone, we have 120 refugees who arrived between June last year and last month. And Kakuma is receiving close to a thousand refugees every month. So the numbers have shifted a bit. If you look at, um, for example, February, we have a total of um, 580, uh, 792 registered refugees, but we have over 120 who are undocumented and 72,465 who are actually um, asylum seekers. So you put it right that this number is close to slightly uh, over 800,000 because the, the data I'm giving is for, for February. So the numbers are rising very fast and 
Dada bus we speak, it's an emergency because you can imagine 120 refugees coming in less than six months. And uh, three camp, two camps have been closed down by the government, but I'm happy to report that the government has gazetted one more camp and registration process is going on to, to have these new arrivals uh, settled in a new camp called IFO2. You remember the DAB used to have five camps. They closed two, you only left by three. So they've reopened one, one of the camps. Um, so who is JRS? JRS, we've been responding to the refugee situation in, in, in Kenya since 1991. Uh, we've mainly worked in Kakuma and Nairobi. Our main uh, operations being education being our biggest uh, project. And education, I must say it's broad. We do uh, um, have inclusive education where we have children learning with disability and those with, without disability in the early grades where we program for in Kakuma. Uh, more recently, we've been granted by UNHCR to implement secondary education in seven secondary schools with a population of about 14,000 uh, students. Um, we also integrate gender responsive education programming within our education program, together with mental health, psychosocial support and reconciliation. But Father Neil will provide more details about that. Uh, we also have a similar programming in Nairobi in the urban place where I told you we have about 92,000 refugees in Nairobi, but there are many partners responding, but JRS equally still uh, has a scholarship for students into national schools. It's a different arrangement. In Kakuma, we have refugee run schools. In Nairobi, refugees go to national schools. So you'll be looking at the dynamics of the two different places. Um, refugees in Nairobi and across the country are able to join national universities, but the challenge is getting jobs. And we'll also be looking at the dynamics around that. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what we do uh, across both in Nairobi and in Kakuma for the many years. Um, we, we've been around serving refugees from 1991 in those different areas, including protection uh, and also livelihood, but also do advocacy because we realize, like I, I was in, indicating initially, without refugees getting jobs, as much as you may offer an education program, they may not, they may lack interest in it because what does it eventually lead to? So I want to stop there because I know there'll be a couple of uh, further questions and discussions around that. Um, I just, before I go, I wanted to mention legislation that has happened around the presence of refugees in the country. Um, the first legislation was done in 2006 when we had the first, uh, the Refugee Act, but it was quite with the encampment policy requiring refugees only to, to be in camps. So even if a refugee was found in Nairobi, they, or because of insecurity, they would be taken back to, to the camp and so. Um, the latest uh, Refugee Act, which was um, passed in 2021, it's comparatively a bit progressive, um, but I think a lot needs to be done. It, in spite of it being uh, passed by parliament in 2021, it, um, it's not been operationalized yet. So there's a Marshall Plan uh, being developed. You remember we just had elections late last year, so that also affected uh, the entire process, but I think the new government has picked it up and uh, a Marshall Plan is being developed in kind of indicating how will the refugees be integrated within the host community. Uh, a long journey to come, but I think some baby steps that we really appreciate. Thank you so much.
Just two questions. One, um, you you talk about a Marshall Plan. Um, I presume that means a plan that's that's got a lot of money and that's big. Uh, is that that's the significance of Marshall? And <laughs> the second is uh, that it, so JRS in Kakuma is working in relation to UNHCR and the government. How does that how does that work? If you could quickly answer those and just. As a parenthesis for anyone listening, and also for all of you, do put any questions uh, in the Q and A. We have have it because we'll we'll move on to a discussion after after we have some exchange among the panel. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Captain Nguyen. I want to respond to. I think it's a Marshall Plan because we have a couple of stakeholders involved in terms of the money issue because. The expectation from the government is that um, the international community is going to come in and help fund this plan. Uh, we have a similar pilot phase in Kakuma. We have a part of Kakuma called Kalobe settlement with a settlement pilot approach where refugees coexist with the host community and development partners come in and offer instruction infrastructure. So they build schools, roads, markets, and have uh, the two communities uh, co coexist among them. On your second question um, is that um, UNHCR leads um, any emergency. And as much as it's a protracted situation, they are leading the operations, but they do this hand in hand with the government. So we have a Department of Refugee Services that manages the camp together with UNHCR. And then JRS comes in as an implementing partner who is then given the mandate by both the government and UNHCR to implement a specific thematic area, just like I have indicated previously. Thank you. Great, thank you. That helps to situate the situation. So. Father Bill, I guess we've caught you uh, in a brief moment when you have bandwidth. Um, you're spending your time mostly in Kakuma. So could you tell us uh, about how you see the situation and about your work and what you see as the major questions that you have in your mind as you look at this situation? Thank you all so much. It's a privilege to be with you uh, today. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so I've been living in Kakuma for the past three years, partly as coordinator for Jesuit Refugee Mission and Identity. Uh, Kakuma, uh, as uh, uh, my colleague Jeffrey said, uh, began uh, in 1991. Jesuit Refugee Service was present there really from the onset, 1992. Emphasis upon inclusive education, care for children with disability, often severe disabilities. Uh, today, uh, the refugee camps are roughly equally divided between uh, Dadaab and Kakuma. The most recent data we have as of March is that you have 255,000 uh, refugees or those seeking asylum uh, in Kakuma and then the associated Kalo Bay Integrated Settlement. Kalo Bay, as Jeffrey mentioned, began in about 2018 in really in accord with the new uh, refugee strategy that's represented in the Global Compact for Refugees seeking to integrate refugees into the host community. Uh, today, the division is about 201,000 refugees in Kakuma, about 53,000 in Kalabaye. The origin of the sending countries, the largest over half would be South Sudanese, uh, that would be over about 58%, uh, percent, uh, followed by Somalis, about 15%, then from Democratic Republic of Congo, about 9%, Burundi, 8%, Ethiopia, 5%, Sudan itself, about 4%. Although, as Jeffrey mentioned, we're beginning to see refugees appearing from the latest conflict uh, there. The camp is characterized by high food insecurity. Uh, nutritional needs are uh, being met principally through rationing uh, in conjunction with the World Food Program. By their own estimates, about 60% of nutritional needs are being satisfied. And recently there have been further cutbacks in uh, 
food provision. The average length of time in the camp, protracted refugee situation certainly is 17, 17 years, so almost a generation, many children born in the camp that may not even be truly uh, acquainted with their own languages or culture, may never have truly been home. Poverty is rampant in the camp, about 65% in Kalu Bay, 68% uh, in Kakuma would fall below the estimated poverty line at one point. Uh, $1.90 per day. It's significant that when we speak of integration and livelihood projects with Turkana, Turkana, where we are, the host community, is one of the poorest uh, counties in Kenya, also one of the largest. Their poverty is 72%. This is reflected in the educational programs that uh, in, in uh, the education in the camp, about 80% of the children in the camp are receiving in Bokalo Bay and in Kakuma primary education, about 14% secondary education. Uh, in uh, in uh, the surrounding area in Turkana, uh, that less than half the children, only 48% are receiving primary education, 9% uh, secondary education. World Bank study said several years ago, only 2% of the girls are graduating now from secondary school. One little Turkana boy was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And his answer was a refugee, thinking that the um, livelihood amenities would be would be superior there. So it's one of the challenges when we speak of integration is the poverty of the host community itself. Now, I, I won't belabor this, but Shikuku has mentioned the various works that we're doing from the beginning. We've been involved with inclusive education. We have five centers for addressing uh, special needs of children with disability, many children with severe disabilities. We have home care, education. The hope is for those uh, who can to be returned to the mainstream educational system. That is, we follow the Kenyan uh, curriculum. Uh, we also have protection centers, two protection centers for women and children faced with or have suffered gender and sexual-based violence. Gender sensitivity runs throughout our programs, the, as does a concern for social uh, reconcili reconciliation. We have a Pathfinder program in conjunction with Southern, Southern New Hampshire University offering tertiary education possibilities, preparing people for uh, for employment, remunerative uh, employment. Uh, and then we have our pastoral work, which uh, involves us in nine churches and really grounds us in the, the daily life of, of the people of uh, Ikakuma from, uh, as I mentioned, there are 20 different countries represented uh, in the camp itself. Most recently, we uh, have been charged with care for seven secondary schools, six of whom have over to, between two to 3,000 students. Uh, I was just there a month ago speaking with the principals of the school, though the education, the leadership is extremely dedicated, but the needs are, are, are profound. Uh, half of the teachers are not qualified. This would be true throughout the camp. Uh, there's a scarcity of teachers uh, to begin with. Um, a lack of resources. Some several classrooms have just been recently converted from areas where food had, uh, rather, uh, wood had been distributed earlier. And the principals told me one of the greatest needs: children are coming to school who are hungry, are hungry. Uh, so that's just again a, a brief description of Kakuma. Our, our JRS work, I think, I'll, I'll say just a brief word really motivated, certainly by humanitarian values, but I would say there's a distinctive religious inflection, a concern for the equal dignity of persons. The question we raise is whose equal dignity is unequally threatened, an option for the poor, for those who are systemically vulnerable. It's been at the heart of our work. It's why we are addressing the needs of children with disability, those who had not would not otherwise be served. I think a deep emphasis on solidarity running through all of our programs of accompaniment, service, and advocacy, as well as reconciliation, a sense of the fundamental equality of persons and their participatory rights. The language, humanitarian language, which I think we refrain from using uh, to speak of them as beneficiaries, casting us in the role of benefactor. We truly want to envision a, a world granted the power dynamics in which there's genuine uh, solidarity. This inspires, I think, the discernment JRS was founded not for a specific mission, but to address the needs of those who are most, are, are truly most vulnerable. And I'll end just with the word of uh, the Day of the African Child and our protection. The little girls uh, had a beautiful little play and the poem they had memorized in English and Swahili 
And it ended with the words one little girl was repeating again and again, I am an African child, give me a chance. And I think that's really at the heart of our, our mission as humanitarian, but as religious. We have a multi-faith membership of the refugees themselves who serve with us. Uh, JRS has truly become and can become a living multi-faith dialogue. So thank you. I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much. I have one question. What do we know about the religious composition of the um, population in Kakuma? Both, I think primarily the, the refugee and asylum seekers, but, but also the local host communities. Uh, that I think, I don't have the exact data, um, uh, Catherine, but I can speak within our own, say, refugee staff that would be represented. Uh, two thirds of our staff are themselves refugees. There's a, a very large Muslim population. Well, this will vary according to country. Primarily, the Somalis would be Muslim. Many of the South Sudanese are Christian, and of those, many are are Roman Catholic. Uh, but you have a variety of strong evangelical presence within the camp as well. But I could not give you exact breakdown. As I say, we have. Our, our churches are overflowing. The Catholic Church is there. We fall under the Lodwar Diocese, though the primary uh, uh, responsibility is entrusted to the, the Salesian community and then the Sisters of Charles de Foucault. And I, I would just mention with them, we were able to represent refugee voices in the Synod uh, through the dicastery so that their voice, their experience could be represented, especially the voices of refugee women. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Sister Hedwig, um, you come at this from a somewhat different perspective as a human rights lawyer um, and as someone who's very concerned with women, but also with um, the challenges of poverty in Kenya. Can you describe how you come at these issues? And insofar as you're willing, how do you see the, the JRS work and the refugee work fitting within the overall mission of the Catholic Church in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. As I already mentioned, I'm Sister Hedwig, and uh, I work at the Association of Sisterhoods of Kenya, commonly known as uh, AOSK. And um, the Association of Sisterhoods is a, an umbrella body of all the congregations in Kenya with a membership of uh, 168 congregations as per now, and then um, running various programs to empower and support sisters in their mission of evangelization and in their works of apostolate. So at the association, I'm a legal officer for the association and also running as a human rights program. So we work very closely with the uh, KCCB, that's the Kenya Catholic Conference of uh, Bishops, and then AMESEA, which is uh, all uh, member Catholic bishops from Eastern and Central Africa, if I'm correct on that. So um, looking at the uh, refugees and asylum seekers, um, from this perspective, I would like in a very special way to really acknowledge the work JRS is doing, as uh, you've heard from them. And uh, from the association where I sit, um, majorly we do advocacy. We train the sisters in uh, supporting uh, these asylum seekers and refugees. And then the, at KCCB, they have uh, this same program in um, uh, Catholic Justice and uh, Peace Department, where they influence or they lobby too for the new Refugee Act that Mr. Shikuku just uh, pointed out came into effect in May 2021. And also, they have done a number of advocacy. But I must uh, say that coming to the sisters uh, at the association level, at the umbrella, uh, body level, we really do not have a program that uh, stands to address issues of refugee. Like we say, we have a, you know, a program addressing specifically, but in our new strategy of 2023-2027, uh, we have that in mind to have a program 
particularly supporting uh, refugees. However, at the congregational levels, now the members of our association, they're doing pretty well. We have a number of congregations um, engaged mostly in pastoral care of the refugees. We have congregations in Kakuma. Uh, we have missionaries, Franciscan missionaries, contemplative sisters, and a number of them uh, engaged in uh, pastoral work support in the refugee camps and um, on point is Kakuma. So they, they are doing uh, their best, but I feel uh, this is my own uh, experience and my own take on this, that the sisters uh, in particular need to be more empowered, more uh, capacity built, so to say, and really, because like here at the association, we have a very many programs on gender, human rights, education, children, and so forth, but to really focus uh, on refugees right from the central uh, point before it goes out. But we have not lost it all because at the congregation level, there are a number of sisters are uh, working on that. And um, my own take is uh, the sisters feel like uh, you know, the, the handle, dealing with refugee is not like working with children's home, uh, working with street children where you can build uh, shelters and bring them over to, you, to closer to you and make interventions. Refugees uh, in the camps have their own dynamics. I give you an example that one of our program uh, dealing with human trafficking. Um, there are two refugees who came uh, who came at our offices and then they wanted to be supported the urban refugees here in Nairobi so the sisters took them up and they're like we can offer counseling services which they did so they wanted to go extra mind to su support these uh, refugees who are uh, from Rwanda to repatriate them but that's not the procedure so they're like now how do we how do we like uh, work because it was bureaucratic for them because they wanted to just make intervention, support them and see them back home. So that's why I'm saying there is a gap that the sisters need to be helped to understand the dynamics in handling and dealing with refugees. Now, looking at the situation of refugees in Kenya, uh, I just want to echo what Mr. Shikuku said. In March, I traveled to Masabit and the kind of security checks and uh, the kind of uh, security that we were subjected to really speaks a lot because they expect a lot of Somali refugees coming in through those borders, and they they're really subjected to a lot of a lot of uh, scrutiny, so to speak. And speaking from the human as a human rights lawyer, then um, I am happy that the government of Kenya has enforced this uh, the 2021 Refugee Act. Uh, however, the refugees still, refugees and asylum seekers still really face uh, some dilemma when it comes to enjoying their rights or their status in the country uh, in terms of security, in terms of how they are handled, especially uh, as already Mr. Shkuku shared, majority of the asylum seekers come from uh, Somali, which is still a very volatile country. And the, of course, the perception and the bias that already exists in terms of security has really put them to be very vulnerable, especially in the hands of police in Kenya, who always view them with a lot of contempt and handle them with a lot of suspicion. So even like uh, now the incumbent policy uh, is uh, amended, but still the refugees, when they get those status, is it class H? To move around, to move to the urban centers or become legal immigrants, they are not free. They are, you know, they are subject to a lot of hardships. Even within the camps themselves, we've had um, cases of trafficking uh, from the camps, and uh, especially women. And the reason being that the the situation in the camps really are the push factors, the congestion the resources, the inadequacy of uh, basic needs, and then the, the kind of livelihood that is subjected to make them very volatile to, to really being trafficked or being smuggled in a way. So this, uh, from the human rights perspective, are some of the persisting challenges 
to the refugees and uh, asylum seekers who have not acquired the status of uh, refugees. And uh, those working with GRS, uh, Mr. Shikuku and father will really attest to the fact that there are so many um, asylum seekers awaiting refugee status determination process. I happen to do a small research on that, especially narrowing down to the interpretation process. And then I, I realized that there's a lot that also has to be put right in camps. And when we look at them in camps, the assumption is they're refugees, but there are still those who are here to face panels and to have their uh, decision made so that they are able to, to be given the status as refugees. And while they are given those, still they have some challenges and I'm grateful. We really are proud of JRS because they're doing a lot, plus the Catholic Church at large and the small interventions that the sisters are doing. And as I say, that there's a gap that the sisters need to do more and they need to be supported to do more. Thank you. Great. Um, you've certainly laid out a lot of questions and I think we'll come back on some of them, including the security issue. But if you look at it from a, from a women's perspective, uh, how far are different congregations working, able to work actively? Are they receiving support to work on some of the issues that particularly affect women and children in the camps? Okay. Uh, the congregations that are really active um, are not more than 10 because we, we, we work with them, we, we like uh, capacity build them and train them, but those who are really actively involved in this, uh, I would say apostolate or work are not more than 10. And I've already mentioned that we have 167 uh, membership of different congregations in Kenya. And so uh, the rest is give pastoral care, but those actively involved, like directly dealing with uh, uh, refugees or asylum seekers, they're not less than, but I stand to be corrected because I have the JRS here, they could be having their data, but from the association where I sit, we really have to open, um, to open up more and to have uh, more sisters directly involved and running programs to support refugees and asylum seekers in Kenya. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, and now we'll turn to uh, Father David Hollenbach, uh, who can I think situate us in a, in a broader setting, but who also has extensive Kenya experience and You've seen it over many years, so it would be interesting how you see the evolution of the situation in Kenya. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be part of this discussion, and thank you to the other speakers for the illuminating comments that you have already made. Now, Catherine uh, has mentioned that I have had some experience in Nairobi. I have taught in Nairobi a number of times uh, for uh, six months each time, about five different experiences being there. And uh, one of the times that I was in Nairobi, I had uh, the opportunity to participate uh, with the Jesuit Refugee Service in several workshops uh, on the human rights of refugees. Uh, one workshop conducted in for refugee, for staff uh, of Jesuit Refugee Service in Nairobi, and another one conducted in the Kakuma refugee camp for an extended uh, stay uh, for the staff of Jesuit Refugee Service in Kakuma, many of whom are themselves refugees who are brought on board with JRS and trained in various ways to try to provide assistance to uh, the other refugees in the camp. And I had the extraordinary opportunity on one of those, on that occasion when I was in the camp in Kakuma for that workshop of meeting a man who was a very powerful influence on me and on my own thinking about the refugee issues. A man named Abebe Fayesa. Uh, Abebe was an Ethiopian refugee 
who had been in the Kakuma camp when I was there meeting him for the first time, had been in the camp for 16 years. Uh, this is an example of what's known as protracted displacement. Uh, the refugees in Kakuma, and this is true of Dadaab also, and also of the refugees uh, in the city in Nairobi, many of them have been in this displaced situation for very extended periods. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees defines a protracted refugee situation as one where 25,000 or more refugees from the same nationality have been for five or more years in a given asylum situation. And I would be willing to bet that a sizable proportion of the refugees in, Nairo in Kenya, both in Kakuma, in Dadaab, and also in the urban areas like Nairobi, have been there for well over five years. And therefore, you could say that these settings in Kenya are protracted refugee situations. Now, this um, situation raises enormous challenges that were made very visible and vivid for me in my discussions and interactions with Abebe Fayesa, a man who came from Ethiopia with some background training in the university in Ethiopia uh, as a psychologist. So, but he had been there when I met him for the first time, had been a displaced person for 16 years. And he described some of the very powerful negative experiences of what it's like to be in such a circumstance for an extended period of time. He, he developed uh, these conversations with me and with several other JRS people in such a powerful way that when we subsequently held a conference in Nairobi uh, with scholars from Africa, from Kenya, from some from the United States, that led to the creation of a book, a book that I have right here simply called Refugee Rights, Eth Ethics, Advocacy in Africa. Abebe made the initial presentation at the conference uh, that led to this book. And he made some very powerful statements, and I'll, I'll ask them to post the uh, uh, the, the article from Abebe on the, uh, on the chat of this when we get a chance. But um, he talked about the situation of protracted refugee displacement and what it does to people. He said that, for example, in Kakuma, the fact that people have been there for so long with so few resources with no, leads to interpersonal conflict. It can lead to conflict within families. It can lead to conflict between refugees themselves, conflict with fellow refugees, and that this kind of conflict leads to, in frequent cases, outbreaks of violence among the refugees themselves. Another situation that is very severe uh, about protracted displacement is that many couples in the camp have children in the camp. There are many babies born in the camp. And as these, if you're talking about being displaced for an extended period of time, these children are growing to the point where they need education and they receive very little of it. Uh, the UN High Commissioner of Refugees is committed to providing elementary education for most children in refugee settings, but it doesn't happen. Many of them do not receive it. And uh, there also loss of education and possibilities of development for adults. A man like Abebe Faesa, who was this powerful person that I had the opportunity to interact with, was talking about how he wanted to take his own psychological training that he had in Ethiopia and develop it f more fully so that he could help the people he was working with more adequately, but he wasn't able to do that. 
many of the people in these protracted situations also have no formal work. Uh, if you're combined, if you're confined to Kakuma for 16 years, or even just for a few years, the only kind of work that can be done is very informal and it doesn't produce any kind of significant wages. And there's a way in which the government of Kenya up till now, and there may be some hope in terms of this so-called Marshall Plan for refugees that wants to try to find ways of integrating refugees into the local community. But at least up till now, the refugees in Kenya are supposed to stay away from the situations where they could get a job. They're supposed to stay in the camp. They're not permitted, supposedly, to migrate to Nairobi, where they might be able to get work. And you can understand why the Kenyan government is doing this, because there are already large numbers of very poor people in Nairobi. And the Kenyan government doesn't want more poor in Nairobi. So therefore, they don't want the people migrating to Nairobi from Dadaab or from Kakuma. And so they're confined to the camp and there's very little to do there except very informal work. And it doesn't produce the kind of sense of self-support and of agency. This all leads, these conflicts, this lack of education, this lack of self-support for many of the situations, it can lead to a kind of loss of hope, a loss of, it can lead to a, a kind of despair a despair and a loss of hope that has genuinely psychological dimensions. It can be seen as a mental health problem that can only be dealt with through what's called psychosocial support for the refugees and JRS and any number of other refugee supporting agencies try to provide that kind of psychosocial support to help them overcome the despair or the dangers of despair. Uh, that they're facing, but it can also lead to a kind of spiritual death or a spiritual loss of hope. And this is where it seems to me the religious component comes into play. Jesuit Refugee Service is trying to provide some values that have real secular import, like education and educational training programs that could give and uh, give refugees a sense that there's a direction in which they might be able uh, to move in the future. Uh, but there's also a kind of spiritual dimension to this about how you can communicate to the refugees that there's something bigger than the suffering that they're undergoing. And Christianity and Islam both have a very strong commitment to awareness of the compassionate presence of God as something that can sustain people, even in situations that are danger, that are that are depressing, and that are experiences of genuine loss. The notion of compassion, to see God as compassion, compassionate, and to see fellow humans as compassion. It means compassion means to share the suffering with another, calm with and passion suffering with another. Uh, there's a way in which a, a compassionate response to the needs of refugees can bring a kind of renewal of hope, a sense that there's something more going on here than just the suffering and loss that I've experienced. And that that's where the religious dimension can come into play. Now, this is not an argument for any kind of making of refugee aid dependent upon evangelization. That's not the way in which Jesuit Refugee Service wants to move or Catholic Relief Service or World Vision and uh, the, most of the other refugee serving agencies that are faith-based are very deeply committed to providing need to respond to the needs of people rather than trying to advance their own religious dimensions, their own religious cause. But a kind of dialogue between a religious uh, displaced person and a staff person from a ser serving agency that gives them a sense that this person is here 
to help me because this person has a sense of the compassionate reality of God and that can communicate that compassion and sharing with those who are uh, displaced. So one of the things that Abebe Feyesa did when he, he participated in a conference that we ran in Nairobi that led to that book that I mentioned, he titled his essay, when it was finally published in the book, he titled the essay, There is More Than One Way of Dying. What he was implying was the experience of protracted displacement in a refugee camp can be a kind of death, a loss of one's very vital li livelihood. He raises the question of whether he fled from the conflict in Ethiopia about whether it might not have been better to stay there and fight and risk losing his life rather than losing what he lost when he came to the refugee camp. Now, this is not to suggest that refugees are simply victims. They do have the capacity to be self-orienting, to be very much per committed to serving, to doing creative things. Um, but if, as, if, you, if you keep people confined to a camp for 16 years, like Abebe was, it's not surprising that some of them just give up. It's also not surprising that some of them become very angry. And if you look at Dadaab and it's bordering on Somalia, there has been action in Kenya by Somali terrorists. And the question arises is this, whether they came from Somalia or from Dodab. If you're in a Dodab camp for an extended period of time and have no hope, terrorism or an act of violence might not seem totally unreasonable. I always say that a good place to generate a terrorist is a refugee camp. Anyway, I'm not suggesting that despair or deep anger that leads to violence is the only response of refugees. It's not by a long shot. Many of the refugees are working with each other, supporting each other, raising good families and so forth. But the dangers that some will fall into despair and some will fall into anger is very real. And therefore I think what we need to do is recognize that when we are talking about long-term displacement, like is the case for many of the refugees in Kenya, we're talking about something that really needs to be addressed. And that's where we get into the need for a serious response to providing what the, high, what the uh, uh, Refugee Convention of 1951 actually says that people should have, namely the ability to be integrated into the society where they have been welcomed, the ability to get work, the ability to have adequate education, the ability to live a normal human life, even under displaced circumstances. This is something that has to be provided. And there are some very hopeful signs that the Kenyan, new Kenyan government is moving in a somewhat different direction from its predecessors with this so-called Marshall Plan for Refugees, which is trying, which is proposing anyway, uh, to find ways to integrate the refugees into the local communities and find ways not just to keep them confined in a world where there's little education, where there's no work, where there's very little resources um, for advancing as human beings. So finding ways to energize and enable refugees to use the energy that they have uh, is something that's absolutely crucial. Um, that's a very important step it seems to me, for the Kenyan government to be taking. I hope it moves forward. It's very questionable as to whether it will or not, uh, but it's hope, a, a sign of hope. And the international community can come to the assistance of the Kenyan government in making that kind of a move. 
So that's probably getting our, our, that's my input for getting the conversation further along. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, um, David. And thanks to all of you. I think you've laid out um, quite starkly um, the situation, but I think you've also laid out quite a few areas where there is hope and promise uh, as we look ahead. So as we go into a second round, let's let's focus on the sort of forward looking. Uh, I do want to encourage any who are listening, including uh, all of you on this panel, uh, to think of, of questions yourselves. Uh, what is it, as we try to bring this religious dimension more explicitly into the discussion of the broad problems of the of the refugee, the humanitarian, the displacement challenge. What, what, what should we be looking at, and what are the areas that might be less on people's minds uh, than they might be? So let's um, go back and start with with Jeffrey. You focused a lot on the overall um, complexities of the situation, and particularly, I think, the contrast with the poverty. Uh, in the area where the um, the Kakuma, it's true for both the Dadaab and the Kakuma refugees, but JRS is more involved with Kakuma, where you do have this stark problem of of poverty, which is perhaps even one that will become more complex with changing climate uh, in the areas concerned. You also you didn't focus on it as much, but it is a perennial issue is that came up in several of your discussions, the problem of, um, of um, security and the tensions, as well as the harmony with, with local communities. Um, perhaps you could comment on where you see this discussion going. What are the, what are, the malnutrition is a, is a very sobering challenge uh, as you, as you, pointed out, um, as well as, of course, the challenges for the for those who are disabled or who who um, come with with particular challenges. Maybe you could give us a little bit of sense of if 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 you were um, in the policy seat, which to some extent you are, but in the broader Kenyan policy seat, what would you what do you think are the areas that need the most urgent attention? But um, thank you so much. I think I must say that um, David, uh, Sister Hedwig, and William have given us really uh, the many challenges that refugees uh, face. And just to pick up from where you shared is that um, the refugees come in a community and uh, Father Billy has shared that the, the data comparing refugees versus the host community. And the trend has been that refugees are pushed to the most remote place in the country and where completely resources are scarce, water is a problem, and even basic food is a problem. Because Trukana County, as Father Bill indicated, is one of the poorest counties in, the, in Kenya country. And Accessing a simple thing as water, which is a basic thing, is a problem. We've seen people's livelihood lost because it's a community that depends on pastoralism. They have to take care of their livestock. And for the last two years, they couldn't completely get a pasture for their animals. So they have lost their livelihood and for, uh, David has just spoken about what that means when you lose your livelihood, you lose hope. And you can imagine if um, the host community lose hope, what about the refugees? Because it, in an, a normal situation, you would expect that the host community would be a shoulder the refugees would lean on. So, that would definitely be a reason for a conflict if at all humanitarian actors come in the in Kakuma camp and provide services. Of course, what we do is we integrate 
the host community into our programming, but it's a very small percentage that get to benefit, uh, especially the ones living on the periphery of the camp, but deep inside the levels of poverty. I've been to Kana where children are walking around naked. They've never seen a cloth. So telling them about going to school is alien because even the nearest school could be miles and miles away. Um, so you ask me, what would I do if I was in a situation where I would make a policy or influence change? Um, the best practice for me is integration because when we have host community and refugees sharing resources, the humanitarian actors who come will not concentrate the services in one location. We would rather be distributing these resources across the population where the refugees have settled. And we have seen this in our neighboring country in Uganda, where refugees have been integrated and you find them living in the villages with the rest of the communities. The humanitarian actors then come in and of course the government coordinates the humanitarian actors to indicate where do we have the largest gap in terms of providing uh, educational access? Where do we have the biggest gap in terms of wash uh, access to wash facilities? So if that is coordinated and refugees allowed to participate in a livelihood program, I'm sure their coping mechanisms will even be better because another challenge is if you concentrate the refugees in the camp, because naturally, if you move to another place and you're allowed to do what you're best at, then your coping mechanisms are much better. Then you come, you're concentrated in a place, someone gives you bits of food here and there, some poor quality of education here and there, some health services that is not uh, able to reach everybody. You sit there expecting maybe tomorrow will be a little bit better. Then your coping mechanisms actually kind of pause. You are just there, what Father David was indicating, almost dead. You can't think about tomorrow. And I think if a refugee comes to a place allowed to do what they're best at, they will make friends with the host community, start to do something that makes them better and give them hope. Instead, what a refugee sits in the camp, and Catherine, you mentioned this, thinking that a miracle will happen and they'll get resettled. Yet only less than one or 2% get resettled. So that reality does not hit any refugee because you think it's a jackpot, my stay here, I'm going to win. So you don't develop a muscle, you don't develop coping mechanisms uh, to learn what to do. And this is not only a benefit to the refugee, it's equally a benefit to the host country. Um, this has been demonstrated by our county governments because when refugees our county governments are the like local governments who, ha who are much closer to where the refugees could be living, who have recognized that a refugee is a benefit and not a problem. And they are granting them, for example, business licenses for them to do trade. So at that level, the local government has recognized that a refugee is not a burden, but a resource. If they're able to do a business and pay a license fee or pay a tax, that contributes to the development of the country. Um, that also brings in that you have a stake in where you live. And that brings in the security issue because if you have a stake in a place you live, you want it safe. Therefore, you cannot join a terrorist group you cannot be radicalized because you kind of ha are happy to be where you are and would want it to be safe. 
The same thing would, I would allude to the conservation of the environment because if I'm here and I'm hoping to be resettled, do I see the need of planting a tree? Because tomorrow I won't be here. So we keep going for fuel, <coughs> which is valid to the host community and depleting whatever trees that could be, we're using it for firewood and not planting any other tree because I will not be here tomorrow. But if I had a future, I would start planting a tree. If you tell me about environmental conversation, it would make sense because I see myself being here uh, tomorrow. So that is the kind of dynamic I would look at and I would, I, I, I would champion for that because it's both pro-refugee, but also pro the hosting um, country. Another thing you pick is that most of the boundaries we have around in Africa are artificial. An example is uh, you find a community living right across uh, Dadaab. They speak the same language. They have the same culture. They are the same people. This boundary we are calling a boundary between Kenya, Somalia, Kenya, South Sudan, or Kenya and Uganda. It's quite artificial. These are same people, if they, the boundary, the artificial boundary would not be there, they would naturally coexist. So why would governments not allow them to naturally coexist the way they would have been without these um, artificial boundaries? So I, I wish to stop there, but I would think that would be for me a perfect situation to look at. Thank you. I think you make a very powerful case for integration going all the way back to the original understanding uh, of, the, of the refugee um, compact, but also the, the recent World Development Report uh, put out by the World Bank on migration that again is making this very strong case that migrants and refugees are assets and should not be seen as liabilities and that given the chance they can contribute. David, do you want to jump in? Yes, I would like to ask uh, Jeffrey and perhaps the other panel participants about what they think about the possibility of this new proposed governmental uh, Marshall Plan for refugees which is directly related to the integration question because uh, if I understand it correctly, the proposal is that it would be providing assistance both to the refugees and to the hosting communities. For example, if it's talking about Kakuma, Bill O'Neill mentioned about how the surrounding hosting community, which is the Turkana County, made up mainly of the Turkana people is very, very poor. And um, integrating the refugees from Kakuma into, into the Turkana region isn't gonna give them much of an opportunity. And the Turkana people need at least as much help as the refugees do. So the question is, is this proposal to try to respond to refugees and host environments in a way that would be supporting the, both the integration of the refugees, but also the development of the hosting regions. Is this, is it making progress? Is there hope? I mentioned that it, it sounded good to me, but whether it would be implemented was an open question because of the, the failures of the government in the past to do these things. But what do you think, those of you who are in Kenya and those okay. in particular who have a, a more direct knowledge of this than I do? Let's turn first to Father Bill and then to Sister Hedwig uh, to respond to David's challenge, which of course is the big mil billion dollar question, I guess. Mute, unmute. Thanks, Catherine. I mean, this looks back to the Global Compact of Refugees and the aim of uh, 
uh, moving from protracted displacement to settlement. But I know Jeffrey has uh, just, I think, received today the, the actual plan. And I think I would defer to him to say a word because this is all uh, just developing over the last really several weeks and months. So perhaps I could defer to Jeffrey to say a word about the uh, where he sees the movement in terms of the so-called uh, Marshall Plan. Uh, several developments have occurred just within the last uh, few months with respect to new government programs and the new Commissioner for Refugees. Jeffrey. Yeah, thank you so much, Father Bill. Um, first is, um, I appreciate the goodwill. For me, the starting point would be the goodwill, the fact that um, the government has demonstrated goodwill is a good starting point. And that gives us a an opportunity then to push more and advocate more toward the government. And this is not a plan for Kenya alone. It's a plan with other development actors. And as you put it, what we, we envision, the plan kind of also excludes particular groups. It's not all inclusive because as it is now, it's only focusing on refugees coming for, from the East Africa community. And not everybody around here comes from the host community. So then the assumption is that once you legislation be made, that then the refugee denounces being a refugee and being uh, the fact that one comes from the East Africa community, then it has a right to benefit from any other service just like a member of the East Africa community. So that has some bit of limitation, but another bottleneck for me would be the many legislations that need to be done before that is actualized because immigration, for example, need to come up with legislation on that process and what document that uh, former refugee is supposed to hold. So, um, it is not something that, it, it, for me, it's a process, it's long-term, but the buying from my end is the goodwill. Thank you. I think a couple of you have mentioned the example of Uganda, um, which is quite widely known within the sort of international humanitarian uh, community for the, for the positive approach on integration. Is that accepted within Kenya? Is that, do people, I don't know, Sister Hedwig or um, Jeffrey or, or Father Bill, do, do you hear about that? Maybe if I can just jump in, um, I would say, yeah, it's really accepted and um, people talk about it positively around what is happening in, in Uganda, but there are also quiet voices that say, could it be a time bomb? That the resources are there to share at the moment, but with Uganda hosting currently close between 1.2 to 1.5 million refugees, could it be a time bomb that over a period of time and the resources are stretched, then xenophobia could set in. Mm -hmm. But I was speaking to Father Bill this morning that as we move towards integration, we need to keep that aware, that awareness that that is a possibility, then come up with the mitigation beforehand rather than waiting for it to happen, then react to that. Okay, if I may also add on that. Um, borrowing from Uganda, I happen to also uh, work in that, especially in Kriandongo refugee camp, where we have our convent uh, close by. Uh, it's really, I would like to recall what Shikuku said, uh, the refugees there really do not have time to indulge in insecurity or anything. They are into fruitful work, they own business, they work, they have, they do farming and they're, you know, engaged in productive work. But now what I saw is um, the question of, now there are so many Sudanese in, uh, in, in, 
in Weale, in Kriandongo, in, you know, there's that sentiment coming up now. We have so many Sudanese, they are the ones owning this business, this shop, they, you know, some Congolese are now, this farm used to be for so and so. So I really agree with Mr. Shkuk that it's a good thing, but we have also to be alert to the long-term consequence. And then uh, back to the question of the effort that the new government is trying to make, um, my, my view is that uh, it's, it's a good thing. And uh, the first thing is, I will ask how far has the implementation of the existing legal framework uh, gone? Because for me, from my perspective is, uh, if the existing legal framework, regional, global, and Kenya Refugee Act is really utilized and people, the stakeholders, the judiciary, the police, the DRA and all those taking part to support refugees are helped to understand. Then we will have no situation in Kenya where police uh, harass the incoming asylum seekers, torture them, and then like treating them that people who are illegal in Kenya and wanting them to prove documents and all that insecurity. And you know, there will be a better uh, treatment of asylum seekers and refugees, and these will bear fruits. There will be smooth integrity integration if really these laws, Mr. Shkuk talked about the number of laws yet to be um, implemented, the legislation, which should, for, for the, the work of the government to carry out any force, that is to be done. But then look at the little we have so far, how much has it been implemented and then we are going to add on more so for me the government looking at even the economic crisis in our country i know it's worldwide i will think that they should really um they should leverage on the civil society organization on the church organization to strengthen the network because that way they will create a synergy to be able to support these asylum seekers and refugees because alone, still there will still be gaps. The law will be there, but then there will be gaps because they will be overwhelmed already. They're overwhelmed. But I know with a strong collaboration, strong uh, synergy, then that will be what they are in, having in plan will really bear fruits. And that is what I think. Thank you. I think you, you make very important points. It's clearly, at least three different elements. One is changing the overall, what we call the narrative, the sort of sense of suspicion of people coming from elsewhere and all of the factors that go into it, which we see in so many countries, in the United States and Europe, as well as Kenya. It's, it's very understandable to a narrative that sees migration and movement of people as something positive, even if it comes out of out of a conflict and is negative. Um, and then I, I think the second is finding the practical tools, which Jeffrey is focusing on, and as well as, as Sister Hedwig, that you have to actually make it possible. And then the third challenge that I know from way back is that the challenge of the, of the uh, marginal areas, as they're called in Kenya, the drier areas, there still are many issues of how to promote constructive, inclusive development uh, in those areas accentuated by climate change. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in. So let me, let me start with the first one is looking for the specific numbers on the um, people. And we have, of course, the, the sort of three, three theoretical solutions to refugee and, and displaced. One is that they go back where they came from. The second is that they're integrated, and the third is repatriation to third countries. Um, and the numbers that I saw, which are from January, are that there was zero repatriation last year, which seems surprising, but that was the number that I saw. And then 97 people out of over 800,000 resettled to third countries. Um, are, are those numbers? accurate or are there other numbers? 
maybe Jeffrey, you probably know that better than. Um, I think both of us remember, I think US it was the government that was taking up the biggest percentage of refugees um, under the resettlement program. And the former administration was a bit tough on that. So that really affected um, the numbers. Um, I think to indicate zero, I will not agree because I think we have people who have left uh, the country, especially medical cases are rather hastened or people who, who are at risk in terms of their lives being at risk. But as I typed in the, tech, in the chat box, the numbers are very low. I think it's less than 0.5%, it's much less than that uh, of the population that gets um, resettled. Just to, to add, I know there's been some um, repatriation because we helped facilitate a, a young boy who was in beginning medical school uh, with Jeffrey's support and JRS. We were able to uh, expedite his repatriation. He's returned to Bukavu. We're paying for his tuition now, uh, and he's doing doing quite well. I'd also mention that uh, what you said in, in uh, Somalia and in South Sudan, there is some migration back and forth of families. Uh, those uh, who children, many of them are left in the camp for education. Uh, their parents have returned uh, back to Sudan. So it's not a formal repatriation process, but it is an informal uh, movement of, uh, of refugees. I guess the basic problem is that the conflicts in, and the yes. overall situation in, in the countries where the refugees have come from is, is so uncertain. I mean, the South Sudan, the Sudan situation, right. um, DRC, um, and Somalia, all of them are unfortunately very protracted, complex right. crises and emergencies. Now, the other question, you yes? Yeah, uh, Catherine, I was just, if I might just say a word about the, uh, just that, because also Ethiopia earlier, we had the flows from there. The, the, the conflicts have been protracted, and that has led, as David says, to protracted situations of displacement. But um, I, I did want to just note that the, the very definition of refugee is to be defined by loss. Hannah Arendt once said that to be loss of citizenship is effectively tantamount to being exiled from humanity. And I did want to underscore that because the paradox of a refugee having rights, they have rights precisely because their basic human rights have been systemically denied. They're defined by loss. And even the language we use in the humanitarian field of beneficiaries, I think perpetuates the sense of estrangement this is true in the camp, and I did want to note that short-term uh, care and management, which is part of the humanitarian ethos, uh, uh, is defied by the, belied rather, by the protracted uh, displacement. The exchange is unacceptable. The loss of basic human rights to uh, mobility and employment, and then the ancillary losses. We had just, when I was in Kakuma several months ago, funeral of a young woman who died because there's no kidney machine in the camp. She could not return to get care. So you're denying certain human rights in order to achieve others. And that may be a short-term trade-off that's morally acceptable, but it's not over protracted situations. So the irony is that in the name of human rights, we are systemically perpetuating their uh, their denial. And I do think here the churches have a profound role in terms of not just churches, but the synagogues. We differ in our scriptures, but in terms of practices of David said an ancestor of compassion, of hospitality, of justice, there, there is a considerable overlap. And I'll just give one example. And, and uh, several months ago, one of our Muslim staff refugees invited me to say, Father Bill, you have to see this woman, a Somali mother, two children with severe cerebral palsy. Her husband uh, was uh, disabled. She had simply despaired, given up. The children were lying on the mud floor sores. We were able to intervene, uh, get what was immediately needed, and then uh, um, act. This was not Christian or Muslim. This was common human compassion, but funded by religious conviction. And I think that's part of the religious narrative. Thank you. Thank you. I 
those are critical points of critically important. And I think it, it comes back to this complex challenge of changing the narrative um, and yes. building on the compassion. Uh, we have only five minutes left and there are now a couple of more questions. This is obviously a tricky one, but if, would anyone like to comment on the treatment of vulnerable people, such as members of the LGBT community in Kenya? I've seen there's actually quite a bit of press on that. So that might be um, something that you would be prepared to take on. Would anyone, uh, Jeffrey, do you want to take that okay. one on? Yeah, sure. Um, first, I would say uniquely Kenya is the only country around the region taking up refugees with um, whose lives are at risk because of their sexual orientation. However, and y y Uganda just legislated, I think this is uh, in everybody's is aware of what happened. And a couple of new arrivals coming to Kakuma uh, because of that. And generally, Kenya is a conservative society. And it would even be much worse if you take it then to Kakuma. I think Nairobi could be comparatively OK. So the environment is very harsh for this group in Kakuma. We were just speaking about it uh, yesterday. Um, they have been put in a corner in Kakuma, not mixed up with the rest of the population. Put in a corner and people go to the extent of throwing stones at them and where they live and abusing their kids, their children and all manner of, of, of things. So I must say it's not a very uh, good picture it's comparatively fairer if they move to Nairobi, um, but for Kakuma, it's very tough. We were even thinking as JRS in terms of our programming around education, how, how do we make it inclusive? But we realize it's something we can't do alone. We have to pull in a couple of other partners. For example, um, making sure that they live with the rest of the other population. As much as we we put them on the side, not in a safe place, and yeah, it's not a very rosy picture. Well, thank you for that very honest um, and open answer. Uh, we're coming to the end um, of what I think has been a fascinating and very informative discussion, and I'm very grateful to each and every one of you for your work, but in this case for your, I think, very honest and thoughtful comments that combine the challenges that are faced, the, this extraordinary number of people who are facing the undermining of their rights and of their very future, and yet the work that's happening to try to address it. So we will hope to continue this discussion um, and we'll hope very much to keep in touch uh, with all of you uh, as we go forward. The recording of this event will be posted and any information that you would like to share um, we'll put into the a notice that goes out about the event. And I welcome very much your thoughts on other ways in which we might learn as we have learned today about the specifics of the situation and some of the underlying questions and principles that lie behind them. So thank you all very much and have a, for all of you in Nairobi, a good evening uh, and in Washington, a good day. So thank you.